Hello and welcome to this event on artificial intelligence and climate change. Um, we have a little intro presentation for you, which Priya will share. So we are co-moderating this event from online and from here at the COP26. So I hope the sharing works. I believe it is shared. Okay. Um, well, I hope we find out if that's not the case. Okay, um, so this event is um, organized by, oh, now we are seeing the slides, actually. Um, so this event is organized by um, two NGOs that are dedicated to facilitating work at this intersection of climate change and AI, which is Climate Change AI and the Center for AI and Climate, and um, by the German Federal Ministry for the Environment. And um, we are joined by a number of experts at this intersection, virtually and in person. And um, we will start this event by um, having three use case presentations about interesting projects that are using AI to address climate change. And then we will dive into a panel discussion um, addressing governance and policy questions at this intersection. Um, this event is moderated, as I already said, um, co-moderated by Priya Donchi, who is um, online, and by me, Lynn Kark, um, on site at COP26. And um, we are both co-founders of Climate Change AI. Um, Priya Donchi is a PhD candidate at Carnegie Mellon University, and I'm an assistant professor at Hertie School. So with that, I want to hand over to Priya Donchi. Okay, so, um, and if, uh, if we could uh, display the slides, that would be great. Thank you so much. Um, so before we dive in to discuss AI, it may be prudent to ask what exactly is AI? Um, and AI refers to any algorithm that allows a computer to perform a complex task. And these are usually tasks associated with human intelligence, things like speech, vision, and reasoning. Recently, machine learning has become a predominant paradigm within AI. And this refers to algorithms that learn from data. And it describes a variety of techniques ranging from supervised techniques that obtain insights from a fixed data set to reinforcement learning algorithms that can learn to dynamically control a complex system. So there are lots of different applications of AI for climate change mitigation and adaptation, as well as for climate policy and finance. These include things like optimizing power grids, monitoring land use, forecasting extreme events, designing better batteries, and analyzing corporate climate risk disclosures at scale. At the same time, AI is a general purpose tool, which means it can also be used to accelerate applications that increase emissions in addition to having a carbon footprint itself. So what can governments do? Um, so we're very excited to dive into this topic today with our expert panelists. We're also very excited to announce the launch of the preliminary report, Climate Change and AI, Recommendations for Government Action, which is co-authored by two of the organizations hosting this event, Climate Change AI and the Center for AI and Climate, on behalf of the Global Partnership on AI, from which we have a representative on this panel. The report features 48 recommendations on how governments can First, support AI for climate applications by bolstering data and digital infrastructure, research and innovation funding, and deployment and systems integration. Second, how governments can reduce the negative impacts of AI more broadly, considering both its applications and its compute. And third, how governments can build the capacity that is needed across a wide variety of organizations in order to support these efforts. The report also features 13 exciting use cases of mature projects that are already using AI to support climate action, three of which you'll get to hear from today. So I'll now hand it over to Lynn to kick off the presentations of these use cases. Great, thank you, Priya. So first, um, we will actually hear by Arshad Mansour, who is President and Chief Executive Officer of the Electric Power Research Institute, or also called EPRI. And um, he's responsible for the Institute's operation and portfolio of R&D and demonstration programs. And he will address today how EPRI works towards leveraging AI in the electric power sector. 
Great, thank you. No slides for me. Welcome from Glasgow. If you don't know, this is the friendliest city on earth, and the Glasgowians have opened their arm from uh, 200 countries where 25,000 of us are here shaping the future of clean energy. That's what we do at EPRI. Uh, we work with 400 energy companies across 40 countries to shape the future of clean energy, and AI has a very, very important role. I'm going to talk about a particular use case that brings adaptability, resilience, and mitigation all in one, you know, in one holistic way, and focusing on power sector. So our focus is on how you make, move, use electricity, and how you can do it in a cleaner and better way. Um, I would say one thing: if you're online, um, and just take a note of uh, the email address called ai at epri.com. Uh, this is the first time, I think, worldwide in the power sector, there is 35,000 curated images of transmission and distribution grid that anybody can get throughout the world. And the biggest challenge that we found in the power sector globally was availability of curated images, and not just image, curated data that can be shared broadly and a process to validate as innovators are coming up with machine learning algorithms. So the use case, uh, start with, I'm going to go to west coast of US. Uh, those of you who are looking at the news, it's not new. The wildfire is causing significant impact societally and also on the power grid. So on the, if you look at a wildfire and how does it impact power grid, the one way it impacts power grid is uh, you have a transmission line or a distribution line that falls down, and the arcing could create a fire, or the arcing could lead to a fire becoming bigger. So we have a recent project, we just uh, did a press release, I think two weeks ago, with Portland General Electric PGE and Pacific Gas and Electric, where we're looking at very high definition images from both satellite and ground to detect early smokes that will allow us to take an action. Now, that is just one step. The action, on the other hand, also requires us to understand which part of the transmission or distribution line has a weakness. Because if you have a corroded conductor, sometimes high wind will damage that conductor and that could cause a spark. It is, if you look at a typical distribution and transmission line, we may be inspecting one in 10 years. And now with AI and machine learning and with the images that we have collected, you can do inspection much more quickly and you may be able to identify where your weak links in their power sector are. And that's where the 35,000 images that we have is going to be extremely useful. So once you detect and once you minimize the chance of a fire caused by a down conductor, the second thing is what do you do? So if you live in California, you've heard the power supply shut down. Basically, you proactively shut down a transmission line. You proactively shut down a distribution line. And when you do that, you have people that are suffering for hours, days. So there is a lot of work going on on adaptive microgrids so that you can put storage generation and while you turn the power off, you can actually run it as a microgrid. And that is a much more complex operation than running actually a larger grid. So we have use cases that are going on on autonomous agent that would be able to match load and generation in real time, both at the transmission level and, and at a distribution level, so we can run a power grid, kind of like an autopilot. There's a learn to run power network, uh, the French uh, trans uh, uh, transmission entity and others in EPRI were engaged in that. And basically what it is looking at is data sets that allows us to create autonomous agents so that we can run a power system automatically. And if you're going to run a microgrid in a real-time basis during this wildfire, then you do need a much more complex and possibly an autonomous agent that is running the grid. So that's an example of a use case that starts with adaptability, resiliency, helps in operating a power network in a different way. And I go back to the biggest challenge. Biggest challenge is collection, curation, sharing of data, and validation of algorithms that are coming in from experts around the world. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Lynn. We'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. And we also have uh, the opportunity to get questions from the audience. Um, you can submit them on the platform. 
Um, so I don't know if there are already questions from the audience, but I have a question for you. So um, by using AI and getting better information on wildfires, um, are you actually able to put even a number on the value that AI adds in these kind of circumstances? Um, or is this something you will be looking into? Uh, we are already looking into it, but it's, you know, it's a human suffering. If you look at how much lives have been, what, you know, the number of lives that have been lost on wildfire, the number of damages, societal consequence of a power supply shutdown that is impacting hospitals, that is huge. So at some point, the benefit cost will come in, but you're talking about livelihood and you're talking about life. So I, that's why I picked the wildfire as a near-term case that's going on right now. It's no longer in universities, even though universities are doing a great job. You have utilities who are now using different ways to A, detect early, B, try to minimize things that causes wildfire, and C, when you have to shut down power supply, what is the alternative to run the grid? Okay. Um, another question from my side, which is, um, Arshad, you made the case that, of course, data is, is extremely important um, in, in, this, uh, in the electric power sector. Um, uh, additionally, of course, simulation environments are the ability to test out uh, control algorithms on test or real world systems, and presumably is also important. So I was curious if you could speak to how EPRI is contending with this particular issue, either, for example, through the learning to run a power network challenge with RTE or more broadly. So on the image side, I said, you know, there's the only place in the world that you'll get 35,000 curated images on the power grid. And just send an email to AI at EPRI.com and anybody in the world can get that. Related to the simulation, if you look at the learn to power, you know, the work that's going on, it's starting with an IEEE 35 bus, 100 bus system. And what we are creating is a stream of SCADA, basically a control room operator looks at different sensors, looks at the SCADA input, and in some cases takes decision. So we are providing years of data, simulated data in which case, and we are opening it up to innovators, universities, so that they're looking at autonomous agents so that somebody could make those decisions like autopilots makes the decisions in flying plane. And we are finding great success. I'll give you another example where the data will be very helpful. Um, and this is happening with EPRI. This is happening with NREL. So if you look at wind, we all know that wind and solar is going to the, you know, in the US we predict 3x to 4x increase by 2030. Well, wind turbine gearbox failure is an issue. And as the wind turbines install base is aging, we need a better way to predict gearbox failures. So you have EPRI, you have NREL, they're creating open data platforms where you're getting data from SCADA, bearing temperature, and that's an unsupervised learning because what you're trying to do is take all that data and see if there are precursors that could tell you that the bearing is damaged or going to be damaged. So I think availability of this data, especially to researchers, the more we can do, and this is where you will hear from Erica, DOE is big on this, um, that uh, worldwide we need to be doing that. Make data that is credible, available to all, and once algorithms are validated, let the startup company or established companies deploy that, and then EPRI comes in at the end where we come in on the validation, but not just on the validation. Let's try it out in real life across 20 utilities and keep on progressing. End goal is accelerate so that AI can provide meaningful benefit now and not wait for another five years. The time to realize the benefit of AI, especially in the power network side, is now. That's very true. I don't know if there are questions from Slido or from Priya. Do you have another question? Otherwise, we have one. Um, okay, we have two questions from the audience. So I'll merge them, and this will be the the last question, perhaps before we move on to the next. So the the questions from the audience are one: What can policymakers do to facilitate the data ecosystem in ways that are useful to EPRI? Um, relatedly, how do you encourage private energy and utility companies to share their data? Well. I'm 
the private utility energy companies are already collaborative, otherwise they wouldn't be working with EPRI and we work with 400 energy companies. Because energy is a, it's a network, especially in the electric side, where you could be in UK, you could be in Bangladesh, you could be in US, and everybody wants to learn. I think policy-wide, you know, we all heard the most, um, one of the best news in, in the COP26 two weeks was not coming from Glasgow, was coming from US. The largest investment that mankind has made on a clean energy transition was made when the infrastructure bill was passed. So there is now an opportunity as people who are going to be using that fund to do work on AI, to work on clean energy management. Let's make sure we have a requirement that open data is needed. Open source is the way to go. And that could be a great policy instrument that would be backed by more than a trillion dollars of clean energy investment that hopefully will quadruple the amount of data sets, not just images, data sets that are available to all around the world to innovate. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today in person. That was really interesting. Thank you. Um, and we know that you have to leave early, so we're really grateful for you to have joined us today. Thank you so much. Um, that moves us on to the second use case, and we will hear from Eduardo Nemni, who's working um, on AI applications for humanitarian assistance and disaster response at the United Nations cent Satellite Center, UNOSAT, based at CERN. And he will introduce their work on um, applications of AI to flood analysis. So feel free to share your screen. Hello everyone, can you see my screen? We can on the virtual side. Perfect, thanks a lot. So, great, hello everyone. My name is Eduardo Nemni and I'm working as data scientist at the United Nations Satellite Center, UNOSAT. Today's presentation will focus on UNOSAT Flood AI, which is an AI-based tool detection, um, sorry, it's an AI-based flood detection tool. But firstly, I would like to thank Climate Change AI, the Center for AI and Climate, and the German Federal Ministry for the Environment, Natural Conservation, Nuclear Safety for the invitation. So we'll go through a quick introduction of UNICEF and its uh, humanitarian rapid mapping service before focusing on flood AI. We'll then have a quick look on case study from the 2021 Southwest monsoon season, and then I'd like to close with some lesson learned and way forward. So UNICEF is an operational program of the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, UNITAR, that provide UN member states, United Nations funds, programs, and specialized agency with satellite imagery analysis, as well as custom tailored training and capacity development programs in the use of geospatial information technology within different application domains. UNICEF is operational operational since 2001, and ECOSOC has recently adopted an historical resolution that recognized UNOSAT as the United Nations Satellite Center. This year, 2021, UNOSAT is also celebrating 20 years of operations. So UNOSAT provides satellite images analysis during humanitarian emergency for natural disaster and also conflict situation. Our 24-7 operational service consists of a team of experienced analysts based in Geneva and Bangkok who ensure timely delivery of satellite imagery, derived maps, reports, and data according to needs of UN agency and humanitarian actors through well-established activation and data sharing mechanism. Among all the almost 400 satellite-derived analysis and products delivered in support of disaster between uh, August 2020 and July 2021, the majority were, were mainly related to major flood events and tropical cyclone. So um, let's see and familiarize ourselves with how a satellite imagery is the right flood maps would look like, where we are mainly interested in the red area, which represent the flood extent. In fact, according to the IPCC reports, flood event that used to be once in a century could become yearly by 2100. And also floods are the most frequent natural disaster and can cause major societal and economic disruption alongside significant loss of human lives. So we ask ourselves these two questions. So how can we best support humanitarian relief in flood prone country using AI? And how can we leverage the time gained from the automation enabled by machine learning algorithms and transfer it to the emergency response? 
So UNICEF designed and developed UNICEF Cloud AI, which is an end-to-end pipeline where SAR, which are rather satellite imageries, or flood-prone area are automatically downloaded and processed by machine learning algorithms to output flood vector data and update operational dashboards. If you're interested in the details about the deep learning model we designed together with UN Global Pulse, you can check the details in the paper um, below at the bottom of the screen. So once the UNICEF Flood AI service is activated, all the available Sentinel-1, which are uh, star images from ESA, overlapping the area of interest are downloaded and processed by the deep learning model, then Flood AI output consists of the flood extent similar to the one I showed you in red in the map before. In other words, Flood AI takes large volumes of raw pixel and it turns them into key information. In fact, in fact after generating the flood extent, Flood AI generates impact analysis, such as the statistic of an exposed and affected population, which are automatically fed into a user-centered dashboard that I'll show you shortly. Flood AI was deployed at the European Organization for Nuclear Research, known as CERN. So since in the aftermath of a flood event, access to timely and accurate data can inform the decision-maker process and help optimize disaster response, let's compare the traditional flood analysis with flood AI. So following the traditional method, each image had to be downloaded, pre-processed, analyzed by a geospatial analyst who then create maps and publish it after quality control. However, in the same 24 hours, Flood AI deployed on a local GPU can process seven times more data, providing daily update and feeding operational dashboard. So Flood AI can process big data in short time, comparing it to, sorry, compressing it um, into key um, information. It's also accurate, produce timely flood update, and it's scalable both temporally and geographically reaching seven times more coverage, and it was deployed following a human-in-the-loop approach, which refers to a partial degree of automation during the deployment of an AI model, where human verification and correction are performed before data release. This framework allows UNISAT to deploy a deep learning model into operational settings while keeping a high level of quality and mitigating the risk of incorrect predictions. This is an overview of the AI flood detection dashboard that we set it up in July for floods in Nepal. As you can see, the flood impact statistics such as square kilometer of floods and flood affected population by admin units are automatically generated and displayed on the dashboard. UNICEF Flood AI was able to process all the available information in Sentinel-1 image overlapping with the area of interest shared by the Information Management Unit of the United Nations Resident Coordination Office in Nepal during the 29 days of activation. So to make the information easily digestible for the user, the feature were tailored to their needs. For example, since the in-country team needed to have population exposure by administrative level, a new feature was introduced to visualize that data. The user was now able to get the data they need in the, format, in the format that was best suitable to be included in their reporting. In this specific case, it was simply CSV file. So big data can be overwhelming, but a simple twist in the data format might be the way to simplify the access to information. Therefore, following a user-centric approach results it to be the best effective way to integrate a deep learning based method into existing disaster response. However, finding ways to leverage the time gained from the automation enabled by machine learning algorithm and transfer it to the emergency response is the current bottleneck to positively impact the exposed community. Collaborating with end user in the field as well as, a, as, well as expert in other domain is key to integrating AI-based tool into existing emergency response protocol, providing access to the requested information in the most efficient format at the right time. Only user-centered map and related information will enable action to be taken by the authority in advance of, during and also after the flood, such as evacuation of person, pre-positioning of relief items, and also aid distribution. In fact, despite the latest advancement in technology, there are many countries that don't have access to big data. So we need to bridge this information gap through capacity development activities, which enable the creation of data sharing mechanism 
for the decision makers. So to conclude, our goal is to leverage the use of geospatial information technology for disaster risk reduction and disaster risk management to develop custom tailored geospatial solutions, which are flexible and adapt to user needs and to facilitate open data access. Thank you very much for your attention. I know also our director, Einar Birgo, and other colleagues are, will be there tomorrow at COP26. So they will present um, at the Commonwealth Pavilion on leveraging the use of geospatial information technology and satellite data for improved climate resilience and disaster risk management. So if you're interested, in, please contact them and, and, and go to, the, to this pavilion tomorrow. Thanks a lot for your attention. So much. Um, I think we have time for one or maybe two short questions. Are there questions from Slido? Uh, no questions from Slido yet. So if folks in the audience have questions, please feel free to put them in. But a question from me, which is that um, for a solution like this that you know incorporates governmental stakeholders, right, both national, international, local, um, civil society organizations, you know, many different kinds of stakeholders. How do you go about actually making sure that you're sort of scoping and creating the, the overall project in a way that is ultimately, you know, servicing the needs of all of these different stakeholders and is, and is beneficial to all of them? How, how, what was your approach to, to doing that? Yeah, thanks a lot for your question. Of course, when you do AI product, you start first doing because you want to see that you actually reach a proof of concept. But then we realized that we had to ask questions. So we simply started to do survey um, to UN Resident Coordination Office, but also other um, authorities and, and local uh, NGOs. So we are asking the question of basically what they need. And since technology is there, we just have to create user-centered product that make sure that the people will have the correct information at the right time. And at, at the time of, uh, I mean, now the technology is there. So we just need to, find the best way to give the information to the right people at the right time. And they know better than me, and, and also to the, uh, than us, and, and as Yuna said, what they need. So we simply have to ask questions. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we had time. Thank you very much for presenting that use case. Thank you very um, much. Okay, so the next use case will be presented by Irene Sturm, um, who is an expert in machine learning and artificial intelligence at Digital Rail for Germany of Deutsche Bahn. And um, she coordinates and conducts R&D of the AI-based capacity and traffic management system as part of Digital Rail for Germany. And today she will speak about how Deutsche Bahn is leveraging the technology for rail operations. And I think she is also joined by her colleague, uh, Michael Küpper. So the floor is yours. Yeah, um, thanks for the kind introduction. I hope you can see my slides now. Okay, I'm very pleased to present you today how we at Deutsche Bahn develop, develop artificial intelligence for automated railway planning and control. Sustainable transportation is essential for fighting the climate crisis. And more capacity, efficiency and quality of service in the rail transport is a key factor for changing mobility. Germany has decided to fundamentally redesign its railway system with new technologies. So in our target picture, the trains will run highly automated at optimal headway. They will recognize their surroundings using a variety of sensors. Incidents will be detected and managed automatically. And at the heart of such a system, there will be a capacity and traffic management system, short CTMS, that does all the planning and scheduling. And uh, building a CTMS for the whole German network, we are talking about 33,000 kilometers of tracks and thousands of trains a day, means that we have to solve huge optimization problems in short time. Here, artificial intelligence is a key technology. And now I would like to briefly explain you how we apply it. Our core method is deep reinforcement learning. This means basically learning by experience. In our case, we have a railway simulation, which is a digital twin of the railway world. In this simulation, there is a central intelligence. This is the actual AI, 
that takes decisions for a number of trains in each instant. So in each instant in the simulation, it decides uh, for a simple action like as accelerating or decelerating or navigation actions like going left or right at a point. The simulation acts and gives back information about the state of the bird, but also feedback. How good was my last action? And very importantly, after a complete simulation run, how good was the global outcome? For instance, the punctuality of all trains during a day of operations. Our AI model, the central intelligence, starts untrained by performing random actions, but this cycle of action, information and feedback is repeated many, many times, millions of times, until from the feedback, the AI has learned to do the task right. So this training cycle may take hours or days, but a trained AI model produces a very detailed plan how trains move in the simulation, how each infrastructure element at each instant in this railway world is set. And together, this highly detailed plan is the basis for a highly automated railway system. So now let's have a look what such a trained AI model can do today. This is a piece of German railway network. More specifically, it's a heavy utilized corridor, the so-called Hannover-Minden corridor in Northern Germany. And this is how it looks like in the simulation. We see little triangles moving around. These are realistically model trains. So for instance, little ICEs. Sometimes we see that they change their color. This is when they perform a passenger stop. So we also have realistically modeled railway traffic. As an input, our AI model gets for each train, and there are 100 in this example, only when it enters the network, when it has to perform a passenger stop, and when it leaves again, nothing in between. And I just run this video again. And by taking these small decisions I was take, talking about, navigation and speed at each second in this railway world, it guides the train to the right locations, it balances, uh, it coordinates the train and it balances the load on the network. And what you see here in this video is the result of these many, many small decisions. And I'm repeating it myself. This together is a detailed operational plan that is the basis for a highly automated railway system. In the future, our system will have to deal with much more difficult problems. For instance, imagine a tree falling down here on one of these tracks. This incident will be reflected in our digital twin immediately. And if our AI model has been trained right, our system will produce a plan, a new plan immediately. So we will be able to react rapidly to the new situation. Of course, there is a long way because before we can solve all problems at scale and also in production. However, the first crucial steps for solving this with AI have been made. And with that, I would like to close my talk and thank, sorry, thank the German Federal Ministry for the Environment for supporting our research. And I'm of course happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much. Um, are there already questions from Slido? Okay, um, I actually have a question for you. Um, so now we actually really have to bring this to, into the real world, right? And um, have this actually work in operation. And in particular, um, I'm aware that Deutsche Bahn really places a lot of value on hum having human operators in the loop. Um, how do you have ex experience already with having um, this this system operating in the real world and how do um, human operators react to it and how you actually um, planning to introduce it? Is it introduced bit by bit in test beds? Um, I would be curious to hear how that will work. Or is already working. <laughs> um, Michael, would you like to ask uh, answer or should I do that? Well, I can, I can start and maybe yeah. continue. So the system is not working in live traffic yet. Uh, and what mainly stops us from doing so today is that, uh, of course, the system will need to ent interface with legacy IT systems of the uh, Deutsche Bahn, because uh, the system will not only 
plan train schedules uh, ahead of time. It will also execute these schedules, just like Irina said, uh, when there's a tree falling or a switch malfunctioning or a train gets delayed, other trains have to be rerouted, rescheduled, and so on. So the system does that live, and the system will uh, forward these operational plans to the trains and to the infrastructure so that every train gets its actual situation-dependent um, scheduling information. So that requires a certain amount of control over infrastructure and trains, and especially when it comes to infrastructure control, it's a lengthy process to um, to go live and, and uh, control actual uh, highly safe infrastructure. There need to be a few precaution and safety systems in between, but we're working on it and we are confident that by the end of this decade, uh, we will have such a system uh, live and running uh, in the inner node of the uh, Stuttgart node in South Germany, where it's, it will then conduct um, and control S-Bahn and regional uh, train traffic. Mm -hmm. One thing I would like to um, mention is, of course, um, right now we are doing a proof of concept. So we are working in these virtual worlds. However, since we have this digital twin, we are able to demonstrate uh, um, our products very early in very early stages and also to interact with them. And we are also building very early product demonstrators where we can involve two days very, very experts for evaluation very early. Well One more thing about this, uh, when it comes to the pure planning without executing these plans, which may for uh, some migratory period still be done by, by human operators, but if, if the planning itself ahead of time could be replaced more and more by this machine, then uh, we would get better schedules, we would get uh, the opportunity to find tricks in scheduling trains that the human operators would have never uh, thought of because they are following certain patterns, historic patterns, so just getting away from those patterns and uh, getting better schedules will allow more traffic uh, on the network, will allow for more robust schedules, more quality, more punctuality, and, and therefore also more efficiency and, uh, of course, less, less energy consumption, less CO2, less environmental footprint. And by being able to add more traffic to the rail network, uh, we'll hopefully uh, soon be able to um, get traffic off the streets. Awesome. So we have one comment and one question from, from those in the, in the virtual audience. So the comment is uh, notes that um, this particular use case has some deep similarities to the learning to run a power network challenge, which also explores the use of reinforcement learning to optimize power grid. So maybe a, a fun offline conversation to have. And this person also says great work in general. Um, the question from a different audience member, which um, Michael Michele started to, to touch on, is how does this tool support climate objectives and do you track any climate-related metrics or KPIs? Well, well, we'll have to see in reality how much uh, more capacity we can really add. It depends on a lot of factors, not only the planning and, and control, but also the, the interfacing with the vehicles and with the infrastructure. So uh, once we'll be a little bit more ahead with our research uh, further down the road, we'll be able to maybe simulate some of the effects and then come up with an actual calculation. Uh, so far, our um, back of the envelope calculations um, estimate that we could put 20%, maybe 30% more capacity on the network or translate that into more efficiency and robustness and therefore CO2 reduction, energy efficiency. Uh, but at this point, uh, we're still working on the technology itself before we get more reliable numbers on the impact. Thank you. This was a really interesting use case. And I also like the diversity of different angles of this, this huge topic of artificial intelligence and climate change that we touched on with these use cases. Um, thank you again, all of the use case present presenters, and we will now move to the second part of our event, um, which is the panel discussion. And um, I'm going to start us off by introducing the panelists. So um, we are joined by um, panelists both from industry, from um, policy and government, and also from academia. And next to me is Pete Kluttenbrock, who's the co-founder of the Center of AI and Climate, where he supports the application of data science and AI to climate-related challenges. And he's also the CEO of Radiance International, an independent climate consultancy. Welcome. Thank you. 
Um, then we are also joined by Catherine Nakalember, who is an associate research professor at the University of Maryland. And she's the NASA Harvest Africa program director, a member of the NASA Serfier Applied Sciences team, and she also serves as the agriculture and food security thematic lead. Welcome, Catherine, virtually. Um, then we are joined by Marta Kwiatkowska, who is the professor of computing systems and fellow of Trinity College, University of Oxford. She's a member of the GPAY, the Global Partnership on AI Working Group on Responsible AI, and nominated by the European Commission. And she has just released, um, together with this working group, a large report on policy recommendations on AI and climate change. So welcome, Marta. Hello, good evening. And then we're joined by Daniel Schmidt, who works at the German Ministry of Environment on the topic of machine learning and sustainability. In addition to promoting machine learning use cases for in, uh, climate and environmental protection, he also works on technical assessments, sustainable AI research projects, and innovative approaches to public good-oriented AI. Welcome, Daniel. And um, then we're also... Um, joined by two more government representatives. Um, we're joined by Erika Gupta, who's the acting program manager for the Emerging Technologies Program in the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Building Technologies Office from the US. She's also the technology manager for the Sensors and Controls Subprogram. And her work on um, BTO leveraged her controls background, focusing on building energy management controls and projects supporting controls for grid integrated efficient buildings. Welcome, Erica. And lastly, oh, sorry, couldn't hear you. Um, lastly, we are joined by Cristobal de la Mata, who is the superintendent for the environment of Chile and he's leading the agency in charge of environmental enforcement and compliance. Um, he previously served as the director of the Environmental and Climate Change Division at the Ministry of Energy, where he led the design and implementation of the National Decarbonization Strategy to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050 and the implementation of the first carbon market. W welcome, Cristobal. Okay, so we're going to dive right in the panel discussion and um, Priya is going to start us off with the first question. Absolutely, and so we have a combination of pre-prepared questions for the panelists and we already have some that have come in for the audience. So in the spirit of sort of getting through these questions and also keeping this a dialogue, um, the panelists will hopefully give relatively crisp answers to these questions and thanks in advance for that. Um, so the first question is for Pete. Um, which is around data sharing. So what are some of the priorities around data sharing, especially based on your experience in the electricity sector in the UK? As we heard from Arshad Mansour's use case, this was also a big call on their end. So be curious to hear your insights. So I think that's a really good question. In the electricity sector, we have the challenge where you've got a lot of regulated industries, a lot of um, incumbent companies who at the moment hold on to a lot of data, but the innovators who need to use it don't, don't often have access to it. So there's often a challenge where these companies don't necessarily know what data they have. So the first challenge we need to do is work out what data is there. So what we're proposing in the report that, um, that was mentioned earlier is that we need data task forces to really think about what data exists, um, on what license it's available, whether it's available at all, what standards are in place, and how we can make it more available to innovators who want to use it to make it AI solutions. Um, so that's a really critical piece of the puzzle. Um, beyond that, there's a whole swath of, of potential opportunities to use data in the electricity sector to do a whole range of things from um, improve energy forecasts to um, optimizing um, dispatch to a whole range of different use cases. Um, but I'll stop there and try and be concise as requested. Thank you. Okay, so we also wanted to touch on other kinds of government strategies. And um, Erica, I was uh, curious to hear from you what governments, um, in your eyes, can do to foster R&D and systems integration in this area. And especially um, based on your experience working on emerging tech in the built environment, maybe you could speak to some more concrete examples as well. Absolutely, I'd be happy to. First, I have to second the need for data 
really that is one of the things we can really focus on to foster innovation in this space is to make clean curated data sets available to reach researchers so that they can then use those to train their algorithms. And one thing we really need to consider as we do that is their inherent bias in these data sets. What, what is the data we're providing? Um, who does it represent? What does it represent? And make sure that the data sets we're creating are inclusive. Um, so in addition to that, also having standard ways where we semantically tag our data so that these AI and control systems that are coming in to operate in the built environment can be more easily deployed. Um, one of the wonderful aspects of AI is that it allows us to scale more quickly, right? We don't have to develop individual models of our buildings and our systems and the way they interact, we can learn. However, that said, we still need to tell it what information we're giving it. So having standard models around that is also really valuable for uh, speeding the adoption of these technologies. Awesome. Thank you, Erica. So uh, the next question is for Chris. So Chile just launched the Environmental Intelligence Strategy, so Inteligencia Ambiental. Um, and so since the area of AI and climate touches, you know, AI policy and climate policy and science policy, how can those different threads of national policy initiatives be brought together to, to, to create AI for climate initiatives? Thank you, Priya. <clears throat> That's a great question. Actually, in this case, the diverse objectives of, the, of these different policies are naturally brought together. Our national AI strategy it was recently launched by the, <clears throat> by the Ministry of Science and included as a key part, accomplished our environmental goals and the, the deployment of this uh, special environmental intelligence strategy. Um, and here, in order to pro promote climate change, the, the trick is to mainstream our work in the broader policy spectrum. AI systems must respond to institutional priorities, and we have, careful, we have to be careful to keep our direction clear and coherent with our own strategic goals. In, at, in the case of the superintendency, we have made a AI a key part of our envir environmental policy as we have made it the core of our enforcement and compliance work. So um, we're happy to share this strategy to the public. It's currently in Spanish and soon to be in English and resumes our efforts in the matter. Our objective is very simple, but pretty ambitious. We don't want just to include AI in, uh, in our internal process. We, have, we want to create a new collective hybrid intelligence within uh, as the whole organization. We are configuring uh, the superintendency as a, an organism that learns from the environment and is uh, gathering information with thousands of sensors throughout the country. So in order to go to the next step, we need to include sophisticated algorithms, of course, and leapfrog from the current state to the state of the art in order to uh, accomplish our own goal, which is protect the environment and uh, respond preventively to environmental impacts on the making. Thank you. And if any of the other panelists want to weigh in on any of the, of the statements or have questions themselves, feel free to jump in at any point. Yeah, I did have, um, I was just uh, kind of reflecting on the first point about uh, data sharing, uh, and this was particularly for electricity, um, but some of the work that I primarily focus on is, you know, developing models and methods for monitoring agriculture, so extracting um, crop land, crop type, crop conditions from satellite data in really large areas, and one of the biggest limitations, uh, data sharing, for example, if you want to build a model um, to forecast yield, you need a good historical record of it and it has to be high quality. So the quality of the data that is hosted within the institutions that should potentially use this data is not very clear. We've spent a lot of time trying to clean through the data to see whether we can actually run models with it. And we find that sometimes, you know, 80% of the time we cannot 
Um, we've most recently looked at trying to generate uh, label data and their efforts towards, you know, trying to address this um, label data that you could use uh, with machine learning models. And while we're putting together this package that we call Crop Havis, which is, you know, a, a, a data set including openly available training data on crop type, um, through the data we had access to and through data that had been shared, we found that we couldn't share about, you know, close to, I think, 90% of the data points we had because of licensing issues. But what, you know, the biggest challenge was with, with that is that um, the better the models that we could develop if had access to all the data that's high quality would be a much bigger benefit, you know, for everybody. And, you know, the model could be replicable across all sorts of scales, you know, um, time and space. But because we have very limited data, we can only test in very limited places. And so if you test it somewhere else, it doesn't really work. And so it's kind of really interesting. And I like that, um, you know, the, the point on having, I think it was like data stewards. It might be, might be, I might be using the wrong term. But I think it's important across all sectors to just know what data are available, what data are compatible with models that are being developed, and you know how can we address those data gaps if they're indeed gaps, or how can we have a sharing stream that allows you know for really smart, motivated individuals to delve into those data and find really good you know functioning models. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um... I'm going to actually address maybe you picking up that thread and, and ask Marta um, how the AI community can, can collaborate more effectively with the climate community and how governments can foster responsible AI for climate action um, together. So um, develop actually international collaboration and also on data. Um, so yeah, I was wondering what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, so first of all, I think the open data, I would like to applaud a pre for mentioning open actually offering open data, because this will help with developing AI solutions. Uh, but as we've noticed, this is also not uh, enough because we need regulation, we need standards, we need ways to manage the data. Um, AI, obviously, is uh, uh, there is a lot of excitement about AI, and AI is being uh, developed into solution for everything. Uh, and that includes climate science. It includes climate science research, uh, but also techniques that we've heard about that uh, in the long run actually have the potential to reduce the negative impact on climate science. But as our report has uh, uh, discovered, AI is not the silver bullet. And in fact, um, uh, what AI and more broadly digital systems can do is they can actually also have a potentially negative impact on the environment, you know, on CO2 emissions, on biodiversity uh, in general. Just think about the manufacturing, the waste produced, the extra energy costs. So what we need uh, in this situation is we need uh, new research, new research that would address um, uh, impact assessment, assessment frameworks so that we can understand the situation better. But most importantly, the AI community and the climate science community are separate. And in fact, they don't know much about each other and they need to connect better because they need to learn to speak the same language and understand the positives and negatives uh, of the solutions that are actually being deployed. So what can we do about it? I mean, obviously, within um, the national environments, uh, because we need not just scientists, we also need engineers, we need businesses, we need regulators, uh, we can rely on government initiatives. In the UK, I should mention Office for AI, 
but there are also initiatives from the research councils, from the societies. The Royal Society has also looked at the uh, uh, report on uh, digital uh, systems for the planet. Uh, but at the national level, that would still be very siloed what we need in order to enable solutions such as open data and open data standards for climate science we need to look uh, towards the inter-government initiatives and in particular as a representative of GPA the global partnership for AI I think you know there are opportunities there are for people to actually take action, become members of the working group, expert members of the working group and contribute. Thank you. Looks like uh, Cristobal wants to jump in, so please go for it. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree that high quality data is, is a, a key element, but in AI research, uh, when uh, high quality data is available, uh, scientists tend to use them over and over to train and develop new algorithms. So I think it's key uh, here to, to prepare uh, sufficiently data on climate change or related matters in order to attract uh, scientists in the AI front uh, to make the, the test beds for, for the new generation of algorithms. Uh, here we, we offer, actually, we're developing and mounting a, a full climate observatory, and we, uh, we will put available high quality data on the Atacama salt flat. This could be actually one of the strongest signals of, of the effects of climate change. This is in the Atacama Desert. NASA centers their objectives there to, to train uh, and develop new tools um, to, to uh, populate Mars in the future because of the harsh climate conditions we're experiencing. So, I mean, we uh, invite and challenge the AI community throughout the world to use this data set for uh, their own research and, and promote uh, thus far uh, examples like that throughout the world that can, can help us to uh, adapt and make us more resilient to climate change. Thank you. That's a brilliant initiative. I think, you know, high quality data and open data. I think this is something that in, you know, other research areas has really enabled a lot of research. So I think I would suggest setting up a competition for certain systems. I should say that high quality data is only a starting point. So what I do in my day job is I actually develop techniques to uh, make sure that the AI solutions and models that we develop are robust and safe because robustness and safety, reliability of these solutions is a big, big problem. But high quality data would actually enable us, enable us to make progress faster in this direction. It's not everything. We still need, you know, maths and a lot of research, but it's a very good starting point. Okay, Erica. Erica. Um, I'd like to react to Yes, I agree. And, you know, it's important. Is she having trouble hearing you right now? Yeah, Erica, your audio is going in and out. Sorry. Um, okay. How about now? If I it's speak now. more. Better, yeah. Okay. Sorry. I apologize. Um, if, if we are able to make these data sets more widely available for researchers, particularly in the building's office, we've been making curated data sets on uh, faults in buildings available so that you can train algorithms to detect faults to correct building equipment. That's through our benchmark data sets project. But just like Marta commented, hand in hand with that, we're developing models which can be used. They're dynamic simulators, essentially, of buildings that allow researchers to validate their algorithms and see if they are accurately detecting faults or how much uh, impact they have on the energy efficiency or performance of a building. One other thing I just want to bring into this conversation that I'm, I'm sure is there at the back of all of our minds, but particularly for data in the building space is privacy. 
um, we really need to consider one of the largest impacts on energy use in buildings is occupancy. It's knowing when people are going to be in that building and what they're going to be using in that building. So as we create these data sets, ensuring that we provide researchers what they need to train and develop algorithms, but at the same time, we're ensuring the privacy and protection of, of personal data. So I just want to bring that to the conversation as something that I think governments in particular need to be very aware of as they're providing data sets for training. Absolutely. And I think from the last few answers, we've seen a couple of different threads, both many kinds of things that need to be done, data, standards, privacy, methods, verification, um, and then also many kinds of entities that, that need to be brought into the fold. So we've heard academia, national, international governments, civil society, for example. And so as a question um, for, for Catherine, um, so could you talk about maybe what kinds of capacity, so in terms of you know, people, infrastructure, finance, just capacity in general, need to be built across different stakeholders in society, for example, academia and the public and private sectors, in order to facilitate the sort of impactful and also equitable um, development and deployment of AI for climate solutions? My, so a bit of context, my, um, my work is kind of on the intersects in the sense that we develop methods, we test them, we evaluate them, collect data, um, and then uh, work to transfer those into institutions. And my work specifically, even though we, as, as, as NASA Harvest, we work uh, globally, my work specifically focuses in Sub-Saharan Africa. And um, despite this, you know, explosion and solutions and models and, uh, you know, everybody thinking about ethics, uh, quality of data, quality of models, a lot of this is not uh, translated um, in countries that have not invested in infrastructure. So um, I was kind of thinking about um, running a model to evaluate uh, for example, the, the, the model for uh, looking at floods, for example, um, in order for, uh, for the model to be able to process so much data, uh, primarily most of it runs in the cloud. And that infrastructure have, has to be in place. It's not physical infrastructure, but a country or an organization has to be able to access that. And so even though that model might work really, really well, um, it cannot work on a local computer, say, for example, somewhere in Mali, because um, they do not have resources to tap into using cloud computing. Um, secondly, uh, there isn't uh, the technical expertise. A lot of it is in private and Institution. So a private company in Mali might have a data scientist, but a government agency does not have a data scientist on their team. Um, and, you know, at this point, I'm thinking about, you know, like a machine learning uh, person, but it could be, you know, a geographic information systems technician. Uh, it could be a person who's familiar with remote sensing data. And so um, thinking about you know, the end end use of a product is really important and kind of trying to address the steps towards getting uh, that the product from, you know, running a model. So we collect the data, run the model, but then it has to be used and it has to be used sustainably. So for looking at um, food insecurity, you need the organization that makes decisions that then, you know, translate into providing emergency support, uh, to be able to access that information. And that might require not only ensuring that they can hire the right technical expertise, they have functioning computers, there's a big one internet uh, that, uh, that would allow them to access the massive amount of data that might be behind that model. Um, as well as, as more data become available or uh, collected in the process, those data are saved and can be useful moving forward. And so, there are so many things in this, uh, if you think about it as a pipeline, that have to be addressed. And there isn't enough going towards these um, sections, you know, besides just the, you know, model development, model being robust. 
thinking about bringing it all the way down um, to a product that's useful in, in making decisions, which is becoming more and more urgent. For example, in the context of climate change, many, many more organizations need access to that flood system that uh, UNOSAT has developed. And they need to be able to run it locally. They need to be able to do it you know, as efficiently as possible because when they're on the front line, there might not be enough time to communicate with uh, you know, headquarters. They need to be able to access that information. It could be somebody needing to send them a text message about what's being predicted. So how we link that to the front line um, becomes even much, much more important. Thank you. So it looks like there are lots of opportunities for governments to actually play a role in this area for fostering applications to help with climate change mitigation and adaptation. Um, since, Christopher, you have raised your hand, um, I would want to have you speak first, if that's a direct response to Catherine. Yeah, no, just uh, complementing, you know, depending on the country, but for us, for example, including AI is not just a possibility, but an obligation. I mean, we, we might never have the, the proper uh, labor force to, to address all issues we, we have to face. So, so the use of technology is a must in order to, to have a reasonable response to, to our citizens' demand. And I mean, uh, we, we are... Uh, of course, we are behind uh, in, rele in relating with the capacities we have, with the, but we have the opportunity all to also incorporate a high uh, advanced uh, human capital in our labor force. Uh, Chile, for example, started the scholarship program about 10 years ago, um, uh, giving scholarships uh, to students to, to, to pursue a PhD in the best universities in the world, but Going back to, to pay back the, the scholarship, they have to do time in Chile, and we don't have enough uh, job opportunities for them. So, so attract them to, to the public sector, I mean, is, is, a, is a good opportunity, and, and we are taking advantage of that. And also, uh, I mean, uh, if, we, if we need uh, the right infrastructure, you have to start sooner than later. I mean, cloud computing now is, is certainly available at a reasonable cost and so bad you have to set up this infrastructure and make it scalable for the next step. The next step uh, <clears throat> pro probably is, is the use of artificial intelligence, but, uh, but first you need to have the capabilities to capture that data and, and curate it in, in the right way. So, I mean, um, in the future, maybe cloud computing, blockchain, or, or all these disruptive technologies will be part of the basic toolkit. But in, at the moment, at least in developing countries like Chile, we're far from that yet. Thank you, yeah. Um, so I wanted to briefly shift gears to a different aspect. And there's also one person we haven't heard from who's Daniel. Um, so there's also this aspect of AI being a multifaceted tool and a, and, and a multi-purpose tool. And um, in particular, you can use it also for applications that counteract um, decarbonization goals. And there are also energy um, emissions um, related to the energy consumption due to computational power that you need for those models. Um, so I wanted to know, as a, as a government, um, how do you prioritize between these different aspects of AI when you want to make it align with decarbonization goals? Yes, thank you. Um, I think that is a very tough question. Uh, I think Marta mentioned before um, that we are moving kind of solved between two poles. On the one side, we have applications just like the ones we saw from EPRI, Deutsche Bahn, you know, said, that already show the huge potential of AI to tackle climate change and are built um, on quality data, which, need, which needs to be accessible. And I firmly believe that we only see the tip of the iceberg here and uh, with more and more machine learning practitioners moving to the tech um, for sustainability field, we will see highly innovative solutions for our environment. But as Mada highlighted as well, there are two sides. Uh, and on the other side of AI uh, is the energy use and the demand on, is, on my, is in my eyes not neglectable. Um, so as long as we are not on 100% renewables and the energy demand of AI is rising like it is right now and for the foreseeable future, we can't ignore this um, simply. 
in this regard, we also have to be very realistic. I mean, as soon as you dive deep into technical details, it becomes clear how complex questions around energy use and energy efficiency are. Um, and we look at hardware, GPUs, um, and application-specific integrated circuits, uh, general infrastructure, I mean, you name it, uh, data centers, various uh, development, tuning of models, training, whether you, you, you use uh, transfer learning or not. There, there are so many different aspects to it. And it's really tough to address these issues from a governmental funding perspective, as by the time you think you build a framework around those questions, you realize that you already work with outdated data. And this doesn't even address unintended rebound effects, like you mentioned, that are often only visible after initial implementation phases. And so my honest opinion is, we need a very dynamic and excellent research environment that works on unsustainable AI on the one end and simply helps us in evaluating these aspects properly. And additionally to this already complicated circumstances, we have, as you mentioned, the use of AI that works against our climate goals, sort of, for example, in making oil production more efficient. Um, and, and we have to be very decisive in singling out these cases and, and actively work against them, um, whether in, in allocating government subsidies away from them or at least in, in actively calling these applications out and steering an open debate around their harm. Um, so, so the question on how to uh, balance this is also a question on how to approach the complex field in the first place and how to make sure to foster innovation by simultaneously create awareness on very um, diverse technical on a very diverse technical level that is fortunately but sometimes also unfortunately moving very fast and that is something that can't be done by by governments alone but needs strong alliances firstly among governments of course but but also alliances for between academia civil society and especially economic actors who don't who don't run away from this challenge and and from their responsibility Thank you so much. Um, are there already questions from the audience? Maybe we can... There are. <laughs> so, yeah, excited to dive into those. So, um, two, I'm going to give two questions from the audience together. So, one of the questions was, in which fields do you see the biggest opportunity, especially in terms of climate change mitigation, for AI and tackling climate change? Now, since I know everybody is going to come in with their favorite pet field on this, I'm going to couple this with another question to try to make it more concrete, which is that um, a lot of the talk among um, AI is a popular topic among policymakers, but a lot of the talk is about the future potentials of the technology. So how can we best scale up impact? So to recap that, uh, where do you think um, AI sort of has the biggest potential in, in mitigating climate change? And then also how do we in practice actually scale up impact within that field? So um, anybody who would like to, to take that on, please feel free. Okay, starting with Cristobal. Yeah, well, in, in, of course, in my opinion, uh, the one key element in climate policy in general is the integrity of regulation. So. If we focus uh, the development of advanced technology that, that can give the highest standards to verify we're complying with uh, climate mitigation actions, I, I think it will be uh, in favor of uh, overall climate policy. I mean, the key here is not to lie to ourselves. If we commit to, to ambitious goals that, like the ones we're seeing in Glasgow, we need to set up a compliance and enforcement scheme that uh, makes sure that this is the case. Uh, and, and so uh, if we invest in AI in this setting, uh, it will be beneficial for AI. Uh, it will be beneficial for climate policy. And at the same time, it will have a positive externality. We will develop a full uh, environmental platform to, to observe the evolution of climate change, give feedback to authorities on uh, on how regulations are taking place, how can we improve them, developing new adaptation solutions. So uh, I believe, and, and this is a, a close recommendation, that enforcement and compliance and AI is a key step for uh, mainstreaming AI policy in climate policy. Pete, I think you like to wait. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll talk a bit about the electricity sector because I think the electricity sector is one that I think a lot of people think is a bit of a solved problem in the sense that we have cheaper renewables these days, which we just need to scale up and keep funding. But I think it's not quite as easy as people think it is. As we get to higher percentages of renewables coming onto the grid, we're going to face a whole series of challenges in how we manage and operate electricity grids. And there are a lot of opportunities for how AI can help do that. So just to touch on a couple, so AI is really good at helping forecast, improve forecasts for things. So as we get to higher percentages of renewables on grids, we're going to need much better forecasts of both demand, so electricity demand as people use electricity, and also better forecasts of uh, renewable supply, so the forecast of solar and wind power and when it's going to fluctuate, so that we can make sure that we balance both of those things perfectly, or almost perfectly in real time, which is what's needed for for electricity grids. So forecasting is one area where AI and machine learning can make a real difference. Beyond that, what I think there's a really important idea for, for AI to do is help balance the grid. So we're going to need much more balancing capacity to um, allow for grids to operate when the wind's not blowing or the sun's not shining. And for that, we're going to need a lot of storage capacity or demand side response. In other words, um, the ability to reduce demand um, when, when needed. And there's a real opportunity for AI to help optimize the use of those that flexible balancing capacity by optimizing, for example, battery storage assets against both the chemistry of those assets and against the electricity market into which they're playing and, and make the balancing of those grids much more cheap to do. That said, in, our, in answer to the second part of Priya's question, how we can scale up um, the work in these sectors, I think what I'd say is that the electricity sector, like many sectors that we care about when it comes to climate change, is one of the more heavily regulated sectors where incentives are set as much in regulation and legislation as they are by the market themselves. And what's really hard for innovators is sometimes to get a foothold in these, in these sectors. So what, we, what I think would be really helpful is to help work with innovators, work with digital innovators, plus the incumbent network companies and the like to create what I call um, innovation pathways to help make it easy for innovators to find a route to market, to get contracts with some of the large companies so that we can create ecosystems of innovators around the, these sectors. Because I think that's what's really powerful because you can crump, you know, the, the big network companies, the electricity operators can come up with solutions, some solutions on their own perhaps, but that will limit our capacity to scale up at speed, the innovations that we need. What we need is many more brains and many, many more um, experts being brought to bear on some of these solutions. And that's why we need to make it really easy for digital innovators to work with the, the incumbent companies that we have in these sectors. All right, Daniel, you seem to be next. Yes, I think the energy sector is, is a very uh, obvious answer. Um, I think we, we've heard a lot of use cases today about energy but one um, one industry that I, I really found interesting and that I only recently uh, also learned about is um, like the whole industry around the circular economy um, and I, I find it interesting how, how there are more and more startups more and more established companies who are going into the field of recycling reuse um, whether it be um, electronics or whether it be um, the, um, the clothing industry um, where there are very uh, sophisticated machine learning algorithms that that automatically sort clothes, for example, um, by its ingredient, and um, there's there's huge potential um, if you have digital twins. And using these digital twins, I mean, Deutsche Bahn also presented today. Uh, they built a digital twin of their their um, the whole train network. And I think this kind of concept of digital twin um, in the in the circular economy is has huge potentials. Um, and I just want to mention this um, because I feel like sometimes it's a bit under the radar, but I find it a really interesting use case, and um, it, it, I think it has huge huge potential. Yeah. Thank you. Even in sewage plants, I think um, they're actually AI, pretty successful AI for energy efficiency applications. So um, the waste sector is definitely an interesting and under the radar use case. Um, Catherine. Yeah, I was going to say the one that I learned too, which ties in directly with Daniel, is uh, on fashion and uh, looking at like recycling or um, having dashboards where you can rent a dress rather than buy a dress that you never wear again, I think is, is really interesting in reducing uh, 
uh, footprint. Um, but as Priya said, it's basically I'm going to talk about my <laughs> my my bread and butter because it's at the intersection of mitigation adaptation, and there's a lot of potential in agriculture. We all need to eat, obviously. So if we all stopped eating, which would be great for the planet, you know, we um, we would all die. Um, so just kind of thinking about where if we can Im- if we can improve productivity within currently used land, there is a huge potential not only to save biodiversity in the forest that we absolutely need, um, but we can you know help communities better adapt. So increasing um, yields has a lot of potential, and 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 AI has a lot of really useful, innovative contributions towards doing this. Um, but to push it, you know, to bring it all the way back is that we cannot really improve what we, we can, of course, improve, but we cannot, if we can't measure what we're improving, we fundamentally have a problem. And so um, where we are at, um, we, we don't have a good grasp on agricultural productivity globally. So we might know that in certain areas where there's a lot of monitoring and a lot of policy, for example, in Europe, where, you know, you can track what a farmer plants and incentivize them to plant something that's actually, you know, better for, for their production. But we cannot do that for a large portion of the world where, you know, a huge chunk of the world's population is. And so um, there is a lot of potential, you know, everything from, you know, modeling and forecasting yield and uh, scaling tested uh seed or um, minimizing fertilizer application or selecting the right kind of fertilizer, the right kind of seed as your, um, as your climate changes. But there are you know, more efficient ways to manage pests and diseases, which could be automated, which could reduce you know, labor intensity of agriculture. There's a lot of automation having, you know, um, even within, you know, after, after, crops are produced, you know, like harvesting, cleaning, preparing. And so I think I think agriculture, because it's so important for human existence, um, also it is has a huge footprint. So if you're looking out, you know, looking at beef production and stuff like that, there is a lot of work that can be done that has significant uh implications for what's going to happen moving forward. So if we don't increase productivity in the land that we currently cultivate, it means that we're going to lose more biodiversity. We're going to see a lot of uh, transformation, more land being transformed towards agriculture, which is ultimately something that obviously should stop immediately. Um, but it will not stop unless we can address fundamentally people's food security. So I, I, I think that agriculture is really important. It intersects with uh, energy use, water use, uh, you know, forest conservation. And yeah, it's definitely my, my, fa- my favorite. And then there's, it needs a lot of attention. As I think Idris Alba said yesterday, it needs to be sexy and we need to think about it in every single possible way of how to make it more efficient because we cannot survive without food and, uh, you know, our planet is on the line. Yeah. Thanks, Catherine. Um, Erica. So I definitely, you know, Catherine, I think agriculture is a really interesting application um, and a lot of opportunity, particularly as we bring connectivity to a broader portion of of the world. And I know rural connectivity is certainly something that we are supporting um, in the U.S. One one thing I want to circle back to is Peter's comments around looking really at AI for applications of grids interacting with buildings. And I think one of the most impactful areas for AI is really when it's working with people, with the workforce and with individuals to help them make more informed decisions and help them be more productive. So if we think about um, some of the work we're doing in the residential building space for energy efficiency, we're developing algorithms that will help people 
manage their loads. So by controlling their, their heating and cooling and their water heaters, this is some of the work we're doing in the smart neighborhoods that are in um, Alabama and Georgia right now. Both of these are really looking at how can we minimize energy use and cost. In particular, how can we minimize peak demand to decrease our carbon intensity in these communities? And since we're controlling the individual thermostats in people's homes, we have to find ways for that AI to intelligently communicate to the residents. We're in demand event. This is why we're turning the temperature down. You still have control, and if you want to override, you can. So really finding ways where AI can improve energy efficiency and improve productivity and mitigate carbon, but do it in a way where it's interactive and works with people to make them more productive or to lower their individual carbon footprints. I really think that's where there's, there's enormous opportunity to leverage the technology. Yeah, definitely agreed. And I think that in general, that sort of human ele element and that element of how do you actually integrate your, your, your solution or your application into its broader system just cannot be ignored. Um, so thank you for those great answers. Um, we have um, from the audience a uh, question that um, the audience member themselves calls basic, but I think is actually very important to framing this. So um, the question is, what definition of AI do you find most helpful? Um, and I'll add maybe to also conceptualizing the possibilities of AI in the climate space. There's a separate question also asking about um, the the, the uh, limits of AI or the associated risks. So basically thinking about how do you actually conceptualize AI in general with its relation to the climate space? So perhaps starting with Marta. Okay, so yes, that is a <laughs> big question. Um, so AI itself is actually uh, quite old because the ideas go back to the 1940s. Uh, and many people are probably not aware of this because the first time they heard about AI is in the form of deep learning. And that was only when the first neural networks were trained, the large neural networks, and then uh, the systems, you know, the AI systems were developed that actually uh, it could beat humans at Go and, you know, various other things. Uh, but what is AI? Okay, artificial intelligence itself, the broad definition is that it just provides reasoning similarly to the way that the human reasons. Uh, but that's a very, very vague definition. Uh, and I think this is technically, this can be reduced to say, you know, algorithms. Uh, you know, we, what we want to do is we want to develop algorithms that work and uh, reason more like humans. Uh, but of course, this is the sort of formal side. That's how AI is defined. But what we are talking about here is machine learning. This is how we can actually develop systems, not by engineering, developing them instruction by instruction, but by simply giving them examples. Okay. And what we use is we use a very anthropomorphic term, learning, but in fact, this learning is just simply identifying patterns and then making decisions depending on patterns. So this is not really learning in the sense that, you know, we talk about, say, babies learning the language. And what we really need, and I think this is my push, you know, for my area, we need to be much more clever about developing AI and machine learning solutions because uh, at the moment, they are not very clever. They are very wasteful in terms of energy usage, deep GPU usage, usage etc. Uh, what we need to do is we need to be able to do one-shot learning the way that a baby can learn by repeating something only two to three times. 
You know, we can't just rely on solutions that uh, you have to provide millions and millions of data points before they can actually do something. Um, so, yes, we have to avoid comparing current AI to what the vision of AI as it was introduced back in the 1940s, 1950s is. We are a long way away from that general AI. Thank you so much. This was a really nice wrap up, <laughs> getting us back to the beginning of this whole event. Um, I want to thank all of the use case presenters, all of the panelists for their great contribution. There was so much expertise in the room. Um, I'm going to pass on to Priya to have the last word. Yeah, and again, thank you so much again to all the presenters and the panelists, and also really many thanks to the to, to the German Pavilion for running such a seamless hybrid event and for also keeping equity at the forefront of how they design these events by inviting participation from you know civil society like us in addition to governments and again by by allowing hybrid participation from across the world. So again, many thanks to the panelists, use case audience, um, and uh, and to the audience for all the great questions. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you.